Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Imagine a quaint English village in 1984, where a schoolteacher's attempt to renovate an old cottage leads to one of the most baffling paranormal mysteries of the 20th century. Ken Webster, along with his girlfriend Debbie and their friend Nicola, found themselves at the center of an impossible conversation with a man who claimed to be writing from 1546. Using a borrowed BBC computer, they received cryptic messages from the past, present, and even the future, turning their quiet country life into a time-twisting adventure. As the story unfolds, we're drawn into a web of historical intrigue, supernatural occurrences, and cutting-edge technology. From six-toed footprints climbing walls to messages from the year 2109, the Doddleston messages challenge our understanding of time and reality. But as experts scrutinize the language and facts, questions arise. Is this a genuine paranormal phenomenon, an elaborate hoax, or something in between? We'll dive into this mind-bending tale that blurs the lines between history and science fiction, and decide for yourself if the past really can reach out to touch the present. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In Victorian London, a grisly murder case involving Maria and Frederick Manning shocked society and caught the attention of Charles Dickens himself. What began as a love triangle turned into a chilling tale of greed, betrayal, and murder, culminating in a public execution that would challenge the very nature of capital punishment in Great Britain. In 1720, amidst a perilous pirate attack on the Atlantic, a newborn's cry changed the course of destiny. Ocean-born Mary, christened by buccaneers and gifted with a bolt of green silk, would grow from a maritime legend into a symbol of courage and resilience in colonial New England. Her extraordinary birth, weaving a tapestry of fact and fiction that continues to captivate imaginations centuries later. On the morning of June 20, 2001, Andrea Yates shocked the nation by drowning her five children, one by one, in the family bathtub. Years of untreated mental illness, compounded by religious fanaticism and postpartum psychosis, culminated in this unimaginable tragedy. Was it the work of a tortured mind or something darker at play? Deep in the ancient folds of the Appalachian Mountains, where time seems to slow and shadows linger, legends have taken root for millennia. These peaks have become a breeding ground for supernatural tales that blend seamlessly with the landscape. The sheer age and untamed nature of Appalachia has given birth to a rich tapestry of myths, from the Mothman to ghosts to the Devil himself. In the heart of Preston, Ladywell Street is infamous for a chilling spectral presence capable of shifting forms, from eerie footsteps to a blood-soaked apparition known as the Bannister Doll. Once a beautiful young woman, Dolly Bannister met a tragic death at the hands of her father, a punishment for a crime she didn't commit. Now her restless spirit seeks retribution, haunting the streets and striking fear into anyone who dares to cross her path. But first, in 1984, a sleepy English village became the unlikely stage for a mind-bending mystery 
when a schoolteacher's computer began receiving messages from a man claiming to be from the year 1546. As past and present collided through a BBC micro, Ken Webster and his friends found themselves entangled in a web of Tudor English, future prophecies, and inexplicable phenomena that would challenge everything they thought they knew about time and technology. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. In the autumn of 1984, in the serene English village of Donaldston, Cheshire, a schoolteacher named Ken Webster was entangled in a mysterious occurrence. As chronicled in the Donaldston messages, Webster allegedly received communications from an individual believed to have lived on the same grounds in 1546. This enigmatic interaction, documented in Webster's 1989 publication The Vertical Plane, which I'll link to in the show notes, has garnered widespread attention through television broadcasts, online platforms like YouTube, and various blog discussions. If indeed these messages breached the barriers of time, what revelations might they offer regarding the universe, the nature of time, and the afterlife? Should their authenticity be substantiated, the Donaldson messages could potentially provide deep insights into these existential mysteries. Ken Webster, assumed to be a pseudonym, found himself amidst these puzzling events as he sought to renovate a dilapidated cottage alongside his girlfriend Debbie and their guest Nicola Bagley. Curious incidents, such as the unexplained appearance of six-toed footprints scaling the walls, added to the intrigue. Despite attempts to erase the footprints, they persisted, fueling suspicions among the dwellers. During a span of days and weeks, the occupants of the Cheshire Cottage experienced occurrences such as the sudden appearance of chalk markings, unexplained cold spots, a strong gust of wind capable of lifting a newspaper, a sense of a presence, followed by sounds similar to footsteps. They also stumbled upon tins of cat food neatly arranged in a pyramid formation and peculiar track marks on the floor it became evident that they were confronting a poltergeist. However, more mysterious events transpired. Ken borrowed a BBC computer from his school and loaned it to his visitor Nicola Bagley, an aspiring show business personality looking to use the word processor for creating comedy sketches. Unintentionally, they left the computer running in the kitchen, only to return and find cryptic messages mysteriously appearing on its screen. In his work, The Vertical Plane, Ken Webster recounts the messages that were received. The initial message was an ominous and enigmatic poem, reading, True are the nightmares of a person that fears. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn, pretty flower, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Get out your bricks, pussycat. Pussycat went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your Redeemer." This message was signed by L.W. Initially, Ken Webster suspected that this could be the work of a playful computer trickster, possibly one of the two women living in the house with him. Yet, as we will later uncover, there may have been another prankster involved. Several days later, another mysterious message arrived this time written in a style resembling early modern English. On behalf of many, I write to express my bewilderment at your unfamiliar words. Admittedly, I too have been inadequately educated. The changes you bring seem burdensome, 
disrupting my peaceful nights. As a respectable man with a charming woman dwelling in my home, I assure you that I have no intention of causing alarm. It is only since my aged book was unbound that my tranquility has been disturbed. I have observed numerous modifications both in my residence and in your abode. Your dwelling is indeed splendid, adorned with lights even the devil would envy, and possessions only the likes of my acquaintance Edmund Gray or the king himself could possess. It deeply troubles me that my home has been violated. Sincerely, L.W. The information conveyed in the messages indicated that Lucas, the L in W, had studied at Brasno's College at Oxford University and had encountered the renowned Dutch philosopher Erasmus on three occasions. As the exchange of letters continued, it became apparent that Thomas possessed the ability to observe and hear specific events at Meadow Cottage. For instance, he would comment on images left by Webster near the computer, such as a drawing of a Jaguar car. In a succeeding message, he remarked, I have come across your sketch of the carriage. Though it is rudimentary and without the horse, it will not travel far." Debbie, Webster's partner, reported having dreams involving Lucas following instances of hearing tapping sounds, feeling as though her hair was being pulled, experiencing physical pressure, and sensing a strong, dreamlike state, revisiting a time when they collaborated on candle-making. Between 1985 and 1986, messages continued to appear persistently on the computer over a span of 18 months. Moreover, Lucas Wainman, L.W., communicated with Ken Webster by leaving messages on paper snippets that emerged at Meadow Cottage in 1985. These remnants were not artifacts from the previous occupancy, but were seemingly imprinted by Lucas utilizing psychic abilities during Webster's time. After an assessment of the messages by Peter Trinder, an educator and Webster's colleague, it was confirmed that they were written in the early modern English of the Tudor era, featuring authentic dialects and outdated expressions unfamiliar to modern-day individuals. The storyline took a sudden twist as the communications persisted. Lucas Wainman halted his writing, and a mysterious associate of his stepped in, sending messages to Webster. It was later unveiled that Lucas had been detained by the local sheriff, Sir Thomas Fowlhurst, for using the light box as a means of communication. Webster uncovered that Lucas had been dabbling in witchcraft. Webster later learned that Lucas was freed but placed under house arrest. Despite being accused of witchcraft, Lucas continued corresponding with Ken Webster for several months. Lucas shared his concerns about potential repercussions from the authorities but persisted in using the light box, writing on contemporary paper and sending Webster sketches of objects in his household. It came to light that Lucas had initially falsified his identity, originally presenting himself as Lucas Wayman and signing messages as L.W., but later revealing his true name as Thomas Howarden. Furthermore, Lucas, or Thomas, questioned Webster's claim of residing in 1985, as he believed that Webster and his companion who provided the light box hailed from 2109. Webster was puzzled by this disclosure and inquired about the figure 1 that Lucas referenced from 2109. Intrigued, Webster opted to send a message to 2109 using the BBC Micro, titling it Calling 2109. The year 2109 promptly replied. Deciphering the responses from 2109 posed a challenge, predominantly revolving around abstract New Age ideas linked to higher purposes. A message from 2109. In the presence of open eyes, vision eludes. A shadowy obstruction serves as the accuser. Quietly lingering in solitude within the veil of darkness, he awaits judgment, silently prompting unspoken queries of a mystical nature through the gaze of the sightless. The soul he embodies is the wanderer, free from earthly restraints or chains or fleshly bars. He stands the guardian of time and space. Here resides your divinity. Another message from 2109. Strive to understand that you three possess a purpose that will forge new paths in history during your lifetimes. We, as emissaries from 2109, refrain from directly shaping your thoughts 
but provide guidance that allows for the unfolding of your own destiny. All we reveal is our interconnectedness under a common deity, irrespective of its essence. Sheriff Sir Thomas Fowlhurst surprised all by personally engaging with Ken Webster using the lightbox, revealing that the current year for him is actually 1546. The exchange continued with Lucas, who disclosed his true identity as not Lucas Wayman but Thomas Howarden or Harden. Expelled from Brasnos College in 1538 for his refusal to denounce the Pope, Lucas Wayman or Thomas Howarden managed to avoid execution for months while persistently communicating with Webster. However, he was eventually directed to leave the premises, expressing his plan to journey to Bristol to procure a horse with intentions to ride to Oxford in pursuit of red mission to Brasnos College. The decision to travel from Doddleston to Oxford via Bristol appears illogical. While the distance from Doddleston to Oxford is 174 miles, the journey from Doddleston to Bristol covers only 169 miles. This necessitates an additional 74-mile trip by horse from Bristol to Oxford. The rationale behind choosing to cover a longer distance to obtain a horse instead of directly reaching the final destination remains unclear. During the 1500s, it can be assumed that horses were available in Cheshire, with sellers likely willing to provide them. The story of the Wizard of Alderley Edge also implies the accessibility of horses during that period. Subsequently, Lucas Wayman bid farewell with the intention of documenting his experiences in a book that he hoped Ken Webster would discover and read in 1985. It was predicted that this book would eventually be found. Upon conducting research, Ken Webster discovered that Thomas Howarden served as the vicar of Barrington Parva Parish in Gloucestershire from 1551 to 1554. It's worth noting that the name, Thomas Howarden, may not have been unique and could have belonged to someone else. The enigmatic messages from 2109 came to an end, concluding the Doddleston Messages saga. Webster then invited the Society for Psychical Research SPR, to investigate the matter at the cottage. SPR's research liaison officer, John Stiles, sent John Bucknall, along with a colleague named Dave Welch and later with Nick Sowerby Johnson, to delve into the events of 2109 with a lesser focus on Lucas. Despite three visits, they left without answers or observing any extraordinary phenomena. Peter Trender, an initial expert assigned to analyze the language of the Doddleston messages held an English degree from Oxford University. Trinder suggested that the language bore resemblance to that of the Tudor era and possibly originated from the southwest of England rather than Cheshire. Historical connections proposed a figure similar to Lucas Wainman serving as a vicar in Gloucestershire, hinting at potential regional ties. In 1996, Dr. Laura Wright from Cambridge University, a more qualified expert, examined the Doddleston messages. Wright identified discrepancies in Lucas's verb structures compared to the era, raising concerns about the writing's authenticity. She explicitly remarked, if it's supposed to look like early modern English writing, it doesn't even look close. Wright conducted a detailed analysis of adjectives preceding nouns, revealing similar frequencies of usage between Lucas's messages and passages from Webster's book at 26% and 26.6% respectively. In contrast, writings from the Tudor period featured a more conspicuous use of adjectives, ranging from 32% to 35%. These findings cast doubts on the language's authenticity as Tudor English. Lucas asserted that his wife and child succumbed to the plague of 1517. However, the precise location remains unknown. Assuming a birth year around 1495, Lucas would have been at least 20 years old at the time of the plague. Notably, Lucas held the position of dean at Brasnos in 1538, around the age of 43. Subsequently, Lucas worked as a farmer in Doddleston between 1543 and 1547, indicating an age of approximately 52 upon leaving Doddleston. Speculation arises that he might be the same individual who later served as the vicar of Barrington Parva in Gloucestershire in 1551 at the age of 56, before departing in 1554 at around 59 years old. 
These timelines align reasonably well, despite initial concerns over Lucas attending university at the age of 43 while serving as a dean. Concerning Lucas's education, he asserted to have attained his degree at Jesus College, Oxford, although the college was not established during his lifetime. It is intriguing that Lucas assumed that individuals from the future would possess knowledge of this fact, given Jesus College's foundation in 1571 by Welsh founders. Hence, at the time Lucas wrote in 1546, the college was yet to come into existence, prompting inquiries into how he envisioned its establishment after his passing. In an initial correspondence, Lucas stated that he considered himself ill-schooled. This self-assessment appears inconsistent with someone who had studied at Oxford University, even if they were supposedly expelled dramatically, as will be revealed shortly. Notably, Lucas was purportedly the dean of Brasno's college, indicating a substantial level of education. The reason behind Thomas Howardin asserting that he was Lucas Wayman is also unclear. Could it be, following an investigation, Webster stumbled upon Thomas Howardin associated with Brasno's college, who later became a vicar in Gloucestershire? Therefore, did Webster change the name to Lucas Wayman to imply the existence of historical evidence? If he spontaneously fabricated the name Lucas Wayman, he might have struggled to find supporting documentation. However, upon discovering information about Thomas Howardin, all pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Webster acquired a new position while still residing in Doddleston. This new role was significantly more demanding. Webster swiftly lost interest in his pursuit of the truth, stating, I became fatigued. I desired to return home to delve into a different subject. Around the same time Webster transitioned to his new job, Lucas, or Thomas, disclosed that he was compelled to vacate his premises. Subsequently, he disappeared without a trace, assuring his acquaintances that he would leave something for them. One plausible theory suggests that Ken Webster and Debbie were the ones responsible for the deception. If another party was involved, it's challenging to fathom how they could have orchestrated it. Despite the lack of robust security measures at the cottage, there were no signs of any break-ins. During their stay at the property, the arrival of messages prevented any potential tampering or manipulation. Webster utilized computers from a shared resource, making it unfeasible to manipulate all of them. Upon shutdown, no data was preserved, eliminating the possibility of covertly introducing information for later display upon reboot. This occurred before the era of the Internet, with the computers lacking modems for external communication. Regarding Ken and Debbie's involvement, while Ken Webster authored the book, Debbie contributed and shared peculiar dreams where she purportedly communicated with Lucas. They reportedly appeared on the television program Out of This World, focusing on the Doddleston messages, aired in 1996, with no subsequent appearances recorded. Subsequently, Ken and Debbie withdrew from public visibility indefinitely. They have not admitted to any deception and have not substantially profited from the incident. Lucas and 2109 have similarly disappeared without further contact. Webster's narrative ostensibly presents a mysterious detective story aiming to uncover the truth. The question lingers around Thomas Harden. Did this enigmatic figure truly exist? Were his communications authentic or a product of someone deeply knowledgeable about existing references? In his account, particularly at the onset of the alleged paranormal events, Webster's character invests significant effort in delving into the history of early modern Cheshire and its surroundings. Through his inquiries, Ken Webster discovered records connecting Sir Thomas Fowlhurst to the sheriffdom of the Doddleston region in the mid-1500s. Lucas's revelation seemed to find support, yet a lingering uncertainty prevailed. Had Webster already possessed information about Thomas Fowlhurst before Lucas mentioned him? And did he subsequently claim to have unearthed Fowlhurst only after Lucas raised the topic? Webster felt a sense of validation when Robin Peedle, a former assistant librarian at Brasno's in the 1980s, uncovered Hardin's name in the university's archives, further affirming Hardin's assertion of his presence there. Nevertheless, the assertion of being the dean of the college 
appears unverified. Webster's transition from a local school to a role in Manchester marked the gradual fade-out of the narrative. To the best of my knowledge, no occupants of that residence have reported any supernatural incidents in the years since. Ultimately, it emerges that the historical information provided by Lucas is inaccurate. Additionally, a highly regarded expert has confidently stated that the language utilized in the messages is not an accurate representation of authentic Tudor English, bearing a striking resemblance to Webster's own language. The complex storyline of the Donaldson messages mirrors that of a 1970s British science fiction television series like Doctor Who, Time Slip, or Children of the Stones. The inception of the entire narrative seems to stem from Ken Webster's playful pranks on his guest Nicola, evolving as his interest in the amusement grew. Initially unfathomed, he contemplated the potential for a best-selling book. Drawing inspiration from the success of acclaimed novels such as The Exorcist and The Amityville Horror, which claimed to be based on true events, Webster formulated his science fiction opus, The Vertical Plane, positioning it as a realistic narrative to bolster its commercial appeal. The prevailing sentiment among scholars in both mainstream academia and the paranormal field leans towards viewing the Donaldson messages as an elaborate and meticulously orchestrated hoax. Nevertheless, irrespective of one's perspective on the issue, it undeniably spins a compelling yarn. When Weird Darkness Returns In Victorian London, a grisly murder case involving Maria and Frederick Manning shocked society and caught the attention of Charles Dickens himself. What began as a love triangle turned into a chilling tale of greed, betrayal, and murder, culminating in a public execution that would challenge the very nature of capital punishment in Great Britain. First, though, in 1720, amidst a perilous pirate attack on the Atlantic, a newborn's cry changed the course of destiny. Ocean-born Mary, christened by buccaneers and gifted with a bolt of green silk, would grow from a maritime legend into a symbol of courage and resilience in colonial New England, her extraordinary birth weaving a tapestry of fact and fiction that continues to captivate imaginations centuries later. That story is up next. I have not done a live scream in a while, but I have one on the calendar now. On Saturday, September 28th, I'll be streaming live on my YouTube channel, on camera, telling stories, taking your comments and questions, and I'll even be doing a couple of giveaways during the live show. For this live scream, we'll be talking about liminal people and parallel realities. Liminal people, we know them in a variety of forms. Shadow people, black-eyed kids, the sleep paralysis figure of the old hag and more, even demons and angels. They may be non-corporeal, but somehow they can cross into our reality and interact with us. That's the subject of our upcoming live stream on Saturday, September 28th on my YouTube channel and on my website on the live stream page. The stream starts at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can watch the show live and send in your comments on my YouTube channel or just watch it on my website by clicking on live stream at WeirdDarkness.com. We are way past due for a live stream, so this is going to be fun. I'm live on camera Saturday, September 28th on the live screen page at WeirdDarkness.com, or you can watch on my YouTube channel where you can also leave comments that I can respond to during the show. Hope to see you Saturday, September 28th. In the early 18th century, amidst the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, a remarkable tale unfolded, capturing the hearts and imaginations of people worldwide. It was the account of Ocean-Born Mary, 
a courageous child born aboard a vessel journeying from Ireland to the New World in 1720. The ship, carrying optimistic settlers in search of a better life, faced a harrowing experience when it was raided by pirates. Amidst the turmoil, Mary came into the world to her parents, James and Elizabeth Fulton. However, their joy soon turned to trepidation as the pirate captain made an unexpected proposition – spare their lives in exchange for naming the baby Mary after his own mother. Reluctantly, the Fultons acquiesced, and the pirate captain even presented them with a bolt of green silk for Mary's eventual wedding gown. Thus, ocean-born Mary commenced her life under extraordinary circumstances, her fate forever intertwined with the maritime folklore. Over time, the saga of ocean-born Mary expanded, with accounts of audacious escapades, hidden riches, and brushes with the supernatural. Some even speculated that she wed the pirate captain who spared her, adding romance to the legend. Yet, amidst the myths, Mary's true story remained resolute. Growing up in colonial New England, she was recognized for her tall stature and fiery red locks. In 1742, she wed James Wallace, clad in the silk gown bestowed upon her by the pirate captain. Together they built a family and led a modest existence, distant from the thrilling exploits of lore. In her later years, Mary relocated to Henniker, New Hampshire, where she spent her final days enveloped by loved ones. Oceanborn Mary's legacy endures, inspiring generations with her adventurous spirit and unwavering courage. While her story may be veiled in legend, the essence of ocean-born Mary continues to captivate all who hear of her. Through the ages, the tale of ocean-born Mary has persisted, evolving with each retelling to embody resilience and fortitude in times of adversity. From her humble beginnings at sea to her revered status in New England folklore, Mary's journey has left an indelible imprint on history. Following her birth, Mary's narrative spread far and wide entrancing individuals worldwide. Stories of her encounters with pirates, miraculous escapes, and settlement in the New World became legendary, passed down through generations. Within the fantastical elements of her legend, Mary's fundamental virtues endured unchanged. She was celebrated not for her extraordinary deeds, but for her compassion, bravery, and unyielding spirit. Over time, Mary's story continued to be retold, with each iteration embellishing the narrative. Some depicted her as possessing magical abilities, while others recounted her interactions with mythical beings. Throughout it all, one constant remained – the enduring legacy of ocean-born Mary. In the early 20th century, Mary's legend found new life with the acquisition of a colonial-era home in Henniker, New Hampshire. Though historical records indicated that she never resided there, the new owner, Louis Roy, embraced her tale wholeheartedly, transforming the house into a tourist attraction complete with period furnishings and mementos. Over time, the ocean-born Mary House has evolved into a cherished landmark in Henniker, attracting visitors from near and far, seeking a connection to New England's past. Despite attempts to distinguish reality from fiction, the legacy of ocean-born Mary has endured, becoming interwoven in the tapestry of local traditions and perpetuated through children's literature and tales of the supernatural. Today, the ocean-born Mary house stands as a tribute to the lasting influence of folklore and the perennial appeal of a captivating narrative. While the specifics may remain shrouded in uncertainty and historical truths elusive, the essence of ocean-born Mary continues to resonate in the hearts and imaginations of all who encounter her story. Charles Dickens witnessed the execution at Horsemonger Lane and was deeply disturbed by the heartless and careless attitude of the crowd towards the condemned. This experience led him to advocate against public executions, ultimately contributing to the abolition of capital punishment in Great Britain. Public executions, once considered a form of entertainment in Victorian London, had a morbid appeal and were often treated like a leisurely event. 
The case of Maria and Frederick Manning, who were executed publicly, exemplifies the grim and intensive spectacle that these events had become. Maria's childhood is shrouded in mystery, with attempts to embellish the gaps. In an era indifferent to childhood narratives unless intertwined with adult fame, survival was the primary concern amidst a high infant mortality rate. This lack of historical insight is unsurprising given the prevailing circumstances. In pursuit of better prospects, Maria relocated to England in 1846, finding work as a lady's maid. Her path crossed with Patrick O'Connor, a London-based customs officer and moneylender known for his wealth and allure, fostering an immediate attraction between them. Despite her fondness for Patrick's affluence, Maria was already romantically involved with Frederick Manning, a railway employee anticipated to inherit substantial wealth from his investments. The allure of financial security drew Maria to Patrick, who possessed ready cash, although his heavy drinking and perceived lack of moral fortitude left her yearning for a partner embodying both wealth and integrity. Disillusioned by Frederick's failure to fulfill the expectations of inheritance, Maria's dissatisfaction deepened. In a bold deviation from marital fidelity, Maria initiated a clandestine affair with Patrick, with Frederick's acquiescence. Patrick's frequent visits for dinner hinted at the simmering scandal within Maria and Frederick's household. In these circumstances, typically it's the husband who becomes the victim of a violent act, such as being axed, shot, stabbed, or any other method of murder. However, this specific case deviated from the norm. Maria made a decision that no one else could have Patrick as a husband if she couldn't, and that she would secure his wealth. Therefore, she resolved to eliminate her partner. The decision was not arbitrary. Frederick and Maria, proprietors of an inn, were linked to a train robbery in 1849. Despite their lack of involvement in the crime, the robbers had selected their inn as their lodging before carrying out the theft. Sales at their inn suffered, prompting them to sell the business and relocate to a modest residence in Maniver Place. The realization that she had wed the wrong individual would have undoubtedly been weighing heavily on Maria's thoughts. In pursuit of the money, she concluded that the time had come to end Patrick's life, with Frederick assisting in the scheme. The initial murder plan was unsuccessful, as Patrick unexpectedly brought a friend to the gathering, leading to a social outing rather than an assassination. Subsequently, the Mannings made a second attempt by inviting Patrick to dine on the evening of Thursday, August 9, 1849. What unfolded next remains shrouded in ambiguity. Nevertheless, Patrick was shot in the head, entombed beneath the floorboards that very night, though the gunshot wound did not prove fatal. His demise was actually brought about by multiple severe blows to the head. The individual who discharged the firearm remains unidentified, while there's a strong belief that Fred was responsible for bludgeoning Patrick to his demise. As a couple, they interred Patrick jointly, treated the remains with quicklime, and subsequently Fred absconded, leaving Maria isolated in the adjoining residence alongside a concealed body. Following this, Maria aimlessly headed to Patrick's residence, and given that the landlady recognized her, she was granted entry. Maria proceeded to burglarize the premises, even revisiting the following day to ensure nothing was overlooked. She confiscated all of his railway holdings and monetary assets. On August 10th, Patrick was notably absent from his workplace, raising immediate concern due to his consistent attendance. William Flynn, one of Patrick's colleagues, initiated an inquiry. After knocking on Patrick's front door, he discovered that some of Patrick's acquaintances were already present in search of him. Upon conversing with the landlady, reference was made to Maria's previous visit. Having attested to planning a meeting at Maria's abode that evening, Patrick's friends decided to investigate there next. When reaching Maria's dwelling, she proclaimed to them that Patrick had not arrived for dinner and expressed her apprehension over his whereabouts. William was now convinced of foul play regarding Patrick's disappearance and enlisted police assistance. Consequently, when William arrived with a police officer the following day, Maria recounted the same narrative. However, Maria absconded that same evening. Upon realizing Maria's absence the subsequent day, William deduced her potential involvement. 
Superintendent Haynes of Scotland Yard assumed control of the investigation. Upon fleeing to Edinburgh in Scotland, Maria's disappearance swiftly transitioned into a homicide investigation following the discovery of Patrick's lifeless body beneath the floorboards in the house where the detectives, alongside William, found nothing else. Maria's trail was easily traced back to Scotland due to her lack of efforts to conceal her whereabouts. She was apprehended, attempting to sell stolen goods and promptly brought back to London for questioning and legal processing. In a rented room in St. Lawrence, Frederick was located. He promptly distanced himself from Maria, confessing, I never liked Patrick, so I battered his head with a ripping chisel. During their custody, the couple turned on each other, with little interference from the investigators who allowed them to implicate themselves through ongoing dialogue. In the Victorian era, marital dynamics and the legal framework regarding murder with married couples were notably peculiar. A female perpetrator who killed her spouse would not face murder charges, but rather charges of petty treason due to the social implications of defying her husband, and by extension the crown. Furthermore, wives were obligated to comply with their husband's directives, including involvement in post-murder cleanup duties. Acting under the husband's orders shielded a woman from being charged as an accessory to murder. However, active participation in the planning and execution of the crime rendered her culpable. In Victorian London, if you were a woman, your husband could request you to conceal evidence of a committed crime, but he could not ask you to engage in the crime itself. The question regarding Maria was whether she was following Frederick's commands. This question was promptly resolved when it was discovered that she had raided Patrick's residence and even invited him to dinner on the same evening, revealing her involvement. The trial, lasting only two days, concluded with Maria seeking approval from the guards escorting her out of the courtroom on her performance. Both Frederick and Maria received a death sentence and were transported to Horsemonger Lane Jail in Newgate. Coming up, deep in the ancient folds of the Appalachian Mountains, where time seems to slow and shadows linger, legends have taken root for millennia. These peaks have become a breeding ground for supernatural tales that blend seamlessly with the landscape. The sheer age and untamed nature of Appalachia have given birth to a rich tapestry of myths, from the Mothman to ghosts to the devil himself. Plus, on the morning of June 20, 2001, Andrea Yates shocked the nation by drowning her five children one by one in the family bathtub. Years of untreated mental illness, compounded by religious fanaticism and postpartum psychosis, culminated in this unimaginable tragedy. Was it the work of a tortured mind or something darker at play? These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get
get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. The Appalachians harbor a multitude of supernatural entities, from the Mothman, Wampus Cat and Raven Mocker, to the Grafton and Flatwoods Monster. Haunted Appalachia stories flood TikTok, with many attributing the region's abundant mysterious phenomena to its ancient geological origins. These mountains, stretching over 2,000 miles from Newfoundland to northern Alabama, predate even Saturn's rings, some say even the ozone layer and the dawn of sexual reproduction. The Appalachian core rocks tell a tale of continental separation and volcanic upheaval that sculpted the landscape we see today. Sometime in the past, possibly the biblical flood, seawater filled this area stretching from the Carolinas to Georgia. Meanwhile, the waters deposited sediments and nearby volcanoes spewed molten rock leading to dramatic geological transformations as the continents collided and shifted directions. Despite the tumultuous past, the Appalachians emerged as a unique and ecologically diverse mountain range, boasting a fascinating array of ecological niches due to their varied topography and climate conditions. Appalachian ecologist Elizabeth A. Byers highlights that this diverse topography has nurtured a wide range of species uniquely adapted to their respective environments, showcasing the resilience that characterizes this ancient mountain range. Andrea Byers, a lead scientist at Appalachian Ecology and Environmental Consultancy, highlights the discovery of unique and captivating species while exploring woodlands and wetlands. Encountering a carnivorous round-leaved sundew with its vivid red tentacles coated in sticky nectar, or stumbling upon the nests of a northern flying squirrel filled with faux truffles from the previous night can be thrilling experiences. The abundance of supernatural folklore in the area can be attributed not only to the ancient age of the mountains, but also to their perpetual appearance of antiquity. Appalachia, largely untouched by human settlement, preserves a wealth of ancient biodiversity with its untouched habitats, ranging from misty red spruce forests to silver maple swamps and cotton grass fens on high plateaus. Could there still be mythical creatures hidden among these ancient species occupying various niches? The prospect is intriguing to contemplate, especially when such possibilities occasionally manifest audibly. Ursula Vernon, a best-selling author known for her eerie tales set in the Appalachians under the pen name T. Kingfisher, notes that the ancient mountains serve as a fertile ground for evoking eerie sensations due to their palpable age. These aged mountains exude a weathered and contorted presence, characterized by dark crevices and profound undulations in the landscape. Standing in certain locations can give one a sense of the mountain's age bearing down like a heavy burden. In Appalachia, the density of folklore is intricately interconnected with the richness of the natural surroundings, an environment unlike the familiar landscape for most individuals. According to the acclaimed folklorist Carl Lindahl from the University of Houston, the profound saturation of the natural landscape in the region often leads to a sense of awe-inspiring vastness that can be overwhelming. Lindahl refers to the research conducted by Pulitzer Prize-winning social psychiatrist Robert Coles, who found that when asked to depict home, children from the Appalachian region consistently portrayed scenes dominated by the natural world itself. These illustrations frequently featured dwellings that appeared minuscule in comparison to the towering mountains and expansive forests, emphasizing the prevailing belief in Appalachia that nature holds a commanding presence. Lindahl notes, there is an element in such a landscape that instills humility and hints at the existence of something immensely powerful beyond our comprehension. Nature, in essence, serves as the threshold to the supernatural realm. The supernatural cannot be separated from the natural. 
Throughout history, myths and legends have functioned as a means to elucidate phenomena that defy conventional explanation within the natural realm. Once infused with folklore, geographic locations actively contribute to the formation of mystical environments. Iceland has a term for such places, a log of Latir, signifying enchanted spots. Despite the Appalachian Mountains predating recorded history, narratives have thrived in the region since human presence began. Noteworthy among these is Judicullis Rock, a soapstone boulder spanning 240 square feet in the Appalachian Mountains, adorned with over 1,500 petroglyphs, one of which dates back approximately 4,000 years. According to Cherokee legend, this area belongs to the Lord of the Game, a colossal figure who roams the land, safeguarding it against excessive hunting pressure. The Crypto Naturalist podcast co-hosts illustrate that stories often serve a deeper purpose beyond providing a mere thrill of fear. Leslie J. Anderson, an Ohio-based horror author and poet, believes that spooky tales serve as effective warnings about dangers in a more engaging way. For example, she explains that using tales of gremlins near a cliff's edge can effectively deter a child from going too close, avoiding the need for grim warnings of potential harm. Anderson emphasizes the power of storytelling in reminding us of the inherent dangers in nature, encouraging caution without resorting to direct warnings. Additionally, she suggests that well-known warnings like watch out for the wolfman can effectively convey the message to be careful in a more impactful manner. The Appalachian Mountains have accumulated countless legends over time, perhaps due to their ancient existence witnessing the creation of life on Earth. The mysteries hidden within the shadows and rustles of its forests naturally evoke fear, particularly for those unfamiliar with them. However, among those acquainted with the Appalachians, they embody a unique essence that transcends mere earthly landscapes. In the Appalachian region, marked by intricate hollows and hollers, densely forested slopes and the emergence of little springs from obscure depths only to vanish again, one is encompassed by a landscape teeming with concealed mysteries. This is a realm where the devil could roam freely and eerie lights could beckon you astray, where a creature resembling a deer might reveal itself in ways divergent from the norm," remarks Vernon. It represents a bountiful breeding ground for trepidation. Nonetheless, inhabitants must persevere and inhabit this territory. Hence, narratives abound concerning encounters with the devil or the uncanny not-deer along with cautionary chronicles of those who erred in their responses. Undoubtedly, this terrain offers boundless inspiration for those who seek to craft tales. On the morning of June 20, 2001, a mother from Houston, Texas, named Andrea Yates, drowned all five of her children, one by one, in the bathtub. Andrea, who had been in and out of psychiatric hospitals for years, waited until her husband Rusty went to work and filled the bathtub with water. As the children were eating breakfast, she led the children, one at a time, to the bathroom. Each followed her trustingly to their deaths. She started with Paul a carefree, well-behaved boy of three. After he drowned, she tucked his body into her bed. Next was Luke, age two, then John, age five. Her baby, Mary, only six months old, was nursing on a bottle when her three brothers were killed. She killed her next and left her body floating in the tub. Andrea was still kneeling by the bathtub when her oldest son, Noah, only seven, walked into the bathroom and asked what was wrong with his sister. Sensing that something terrible was happening, he ran, but his mother quickly caught him and dragged him back to the bathroom. He was the only one of the children that put up a fight. Noah was placed in the bed with his brothers, and then Mary was tucked carefully into John's arms. In less than an hour, all of Andrea Yates's children were dead. Andrea sat down next to the telephone and dialed 911. She answered the dispatcher's questions with no emotion. 
She wouldn't say what happened, only that the police needed to come to her home right away. And then she dialed her husband, Rusty, at work. She told him that he needed to come home. When he asked her over and over what was wrong, she finally replied, the children. He later said that his heart sank. He knew that she had done something awful. He knew this because he had been warned. Due to Andrea's frequent battles with mental illness, he had been warned by doctors that she could not be left unsupervised. But Rusty thought he knew better. If Andrea wasn't given some trust, she'd never get better. So he left her alone with the children. His mother was supposed to come and check on the family later that morning. She was expected within an hour. But during that hour, Andrea murdered all five children. When the police arrived at the Yates' home, they found Andrea sitting calm and composed. Officers said that it looked as though the children had been posed on the bed, arranged as if for the kind of family photo the Yates had been so fond of taking. Andrea immediately confessed to the murders and said that she had been planning them for two years. She wasn't a good mother, she explained, and killed the children because she didn't want them to suffer. The murders of the Yates children made national news. People across the nation were horrified that a mother could do such a thing to her own children, and everyone struggled to understand why she had killed them. There seemed to be little question that Andrea Yates was either evil or insane. Which was it? And why? Growing up, there had been no sign that Andrea Yates would descend into madness. In high school, she was captain of the swim team, an officer in the National Honor Society, and class valedictorian. She studied nursing and excelled at it, practicing as a registered nurse from 1986 to 1994 at a local cancer center. She was friendly, kind, and always smiling, and her patients loved her. The only trouble she had had was in her love life. She didn't start dating until she was 23, and her first serious relationship ended in a bad breakup. But then she met outgoing former jock Rusty Yates, who worked as a computer systems designer for NASA. They lived in the same apartment building and started dating, bonding quickly over their Christian beliefs. Rusty was devout and followed strict religious beliefs, including the biblical commandment to be fruitful and multiply. Once they were married, he wanted to have as many children as possible with Andrea, and over the next eight years they had four boys and a girl together, all the babies that Andrea would eventually kill. During her marriage to Rusty, signs of Andrea's insanity began to emerge, exacerbated by the stress of having children and by the stress of the strict religious rules that were followed in their home. The couple had been enamored with the preaching of Michael Warren Jackie, a fundamentalist Christian showman who stressed that the end of the world was near, that God's wrath was coming, and that to avoid eternal damnation, you had to turn your back on satanic worldly things and fanatically devote your life to Christ. He was a strict, fire and brimstone, old school misogynist who demanded that women agree to their husbands' every need because they were the lesser sex and had brought ruin to man because of the sins of Eve. Warren Checky was a traveling minister, holding revivals in various towns and staying on the move. Inspired by this lifestyle, Rusty sold the family's home and moved them into a trailer. Then they moved into a bus that he had bought from Warren Jackie. Noah and John slept in the luggage compartment while the rest of the family shared the rest of the interior. By then, Andrea was already starting to come apart. Shortly after her first child was born in 1994, Andrea said she experienced a disturbing vision of someone getting stabbed. After the birth of Luke, her fourth child, she claimed she began to hear the voice of the devil himself, urging her to kill her children. One day, in June 1999, Rusty came home from work and found Andrea chewing on her fingers. Not her fingernails, but the fingers themselves. He cleaned up the blood and bandaged her as best he could, admonishing her for her behavior. The next day, after he left for work, she attempted suicide by overdosing on pills. She told hospital workers that she wanted to sleep forever. They put her on antidepressants, hoping that would help. They didn't. 
A short time later, she tried to kill herself again, this time with a knife. Pleading with doctors and nurses to let her die, she was hospitalized again and was given antipsychotic drugs. She was diagnosed with severe postpartum depression and was warned that if she had more children, it almost guaranteed a psychotic break. Within weeks, Andrea was pregnant with her fifth child. Her condition stabilized, but not for long. After her father's death in March 2001, she stopped taking her medication, stopped feeding Mary, and began cutting herself as she obsessively read the Bible. She picked at her hair, leaving bald patches on her scalp, and began cutting lines up and down her legs. Finally, she stopped feeding all the children, claiming they were eating too much. On May 3, 2011, after relatives noticed that she kept filling up the bathtub without offering a coherent reason for doing it, she was readmitted to the hospital. Once there, she was catatonic for the next 10 days. She was not improving. Arguably, she was getting worse, much worse. And then she was released. Her insurance wouldn't pay for her to stay longer. Of course, the morning of June 20th followed. At trial, Andrea went against the wishes of her defense team, confessed her crimes, and begged for punishment. She claimed that the devil had forced her to kill her children. He often spoke to her through cartoon characters on TV. A prosecution psychiatrist explained that she believed that if she killed her children, the state would execute her, Satan would be eliminated from the world, and her children would be saved. She believed that drowning them would keep them safe from Satan, and they would go up to heaven, where God would keep them safe. She also claimed that her two suicide attempts had been vain efforts to spare her children by killing the devil himself. Her delusions were heavily influenced by the religious fanaticism encouraged by her husband and church. Even after all of that, the jury found her medically competent to stand trial, and she was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison. However, problems occurred with the legalities of the trial, and she was returned to the courtroom, where she was now found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to a high-security mental facility. She will undoubtedly remain behind bars for the rest of her life. Sane or insane? Did the devil make her do it? Or did she murder her children simply because she wanted to? We'll likely never know. What we do know, though, is that five children never got the chance to become adults after that deadly morning in 2001. And that is the greatest injustice of all. When Weird Darkness returns, in the heart of Preston, Lady Well Street is infamous for a chilling spectral presence capable of shifting forms from eerie footsteps to a blood-soaked apparition known as the Bannister Doll. Once a beautiful young woman, Dolly Bannister met a tragic death at the hands of her father, a punishment for a crime she didn't commit. Now her restless spirit seeks retribution, haunting the streets and striking fear into anyone who dares to cross her path. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the US, Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com.
Ladywell Street in Preston is well known for a particularly eerie haunting. The spectral presence is said to have the ability to transform into different shapes, with some witnesses describing eerie footsteps, mysterious lanterns, a child, a black dog, and most chillingly, the banister doll itself. Legend has it that this entity was once a beautiful young woman who met a tragic end by being whipped to death. This story has faced some skepticism over the years, as the supposed background of the haunting has been questioned. There are conflicting accounts regarding her father, who was purported to be either the mayor of Preston or a wealthy mill owner living on Snow Hill. Historical records for Preston do not seem to corroborate these claims. However, it has been discovered that a John Bannister was once in charge of a house of correction near Ladywell Street, specifically at the former Greyfriars Convent. Whippings were a regular occurrence at this establishment, and it's revealed that John had a daughter named Dorothy Bannister, affectionately called Dolly. This revelation sheds new light on the origins of this chilling legend. In the 18th century, Dolly, a young lady admired by many with several suitors, shocked her widowed father by revealing her pregnancy, tarnishing the family's reputation. Enraged, her father publicly punished her, leading to her tragic death. Only afterward did he discover the truth. Dolly had been a victim of rape, not a participant in a scandalous affair. The profound tragedy of her death is believed to linger as a spectral presence in the vicinity where she met her unjust fate. Dolly was laid to rest at Holy Trinity Churchyard, a place still haunted by her memory. Shortly after Dorothy's passing, the lifeless body of a young man was found in the town center, with his ribcage and skull brutally crushed beyond recognition. Authorities were puzzled by the gruesome nature of his demise, unable to provide a logical explanation for such a horrifying fate. Just a fortnight later, another individual met a similarly unexplained end. The discovery of a third deceased young man left the local community in a state of fear. Were they witnessing the beginning of a vengeful killing spree orchestrated by the spirit of Dolly Bannister? While the enigmatic deaths ceased thereafter, sightings of Dolly became more frequent. As dusk settled in, a ghostly figure was spotted ascending Snow Hill from Ladywell Street almost every evening, its eerie presence instilling such dread in the residents of Preston that they began avoiding the area altogether. To this day, the Bannister doll continues to emerge from the shadows, tormenting both locals and visitors alike. It stalks lone travelers along dim, deserted streets, sometimes even attempting to engage them in conversation. However, upon realizing that the woman behind them is a blood-soaked apparition, most individuals flee in sheer terror. Having been a victim of unspeakable crimes, it's not surprising that the Bannister doll remains unrested, forever seeking retribution throughout eternity. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. While on the site, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own true paranormal or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 3 verse 18, And I pray that you may have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. And a final thought. 
Our whole life is taken up with anxiety for personal security, with preparations for living so that we really never live at all. Leo Tolstoy I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.